Hi, welcome back. I'm Terry Burns. This is a continuation of my class on the Monus Hieroglyphica or Hieroglyphic Monad of Dr. John D. And actually, this is a redo of class eight. So I apologize to my subscribers. If you have already seen this, I'm just redoing this video because there were a couple things I didn't catch in the uh, editing. Basically, I said uh, quaternary a couple of times when I should have said ternary and I didn't catch it. So I figured I might as well, just to be accurate, redo the whole thing. So class eight theorem eight, we're going to talk about letters as shapes, knowing that D considers the three sacred alphabets and says in his letter to Maximilian that he considers the three sacred alphabets, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Okay, so if you are here, hopefully you've been watching the previous videos in the class on the letter to Maximilian. We went into that word by word, literally. Also the letter to printer Silvius. Um, we also had some uh, introduction, to both teased out of the letter and in an introductory video, looking at cosmogenic texts, that is, texts about the creation of the universe, like Plato's Timaeus, like the Sefer Yetzera, um, its representation in Hermetic Kabbalah and the Bible, especially Genesis and Revelation. And if you're here, it goes without saying that you know who John Dee is and you know what the Monus Hieroglyphica is is. This isn't a complicated class, but it's not an introduction to who John D is class. All right, so please watch those early, earlier videos. If you don't, some of what I'm saying may not make a whole lot of sense. D is taking apart this symbol, his monos glyph, and putting it back together as his hermetic symbol of literally everything, how the world was created. All right, in earlier videos, we have just talked about in theorem six and seven, the ternary, something that refers to three, quaternary, something that refers to four, the septenary, something that refers to seven. And we've looked at these in terms of the idea in Plato's Timaeus. We've also looked at the cube as a hidden octad because of the notion that D is always flipping forms. A circle always implies a sphere. A square will always imply a cube and so forth. Time and space measures in the Timaeus, in the world of being, are eternal, unchanging, perfect. In the temporal one, they are imperfect, and they're always changing. So in that temporal world, the world of flux, which we discussed in video seven, we may not even be sure what forms we're looking at, what elements they're made of. This is expressed philosophically in terms of Heraclitan flux, which is a concept often applied to the Timaeus. So one of the ways that you resurrect, so to speak, that concept of the good that is so important in Platonic and Neoplatonic thought is by pondering perfect forms. We've also seen how D is linking similar concepts to numbers associated with that concept. So a cube can be sometimes called a hexahedron, right? Hex six, because there are six faces. There's a hidden octad, eight, eight vertices. And that was six and seven because we have seven days in a week and time measurements are not perfect. That gets linked to the idea of magical flux. So we're going to figure that theorem eight is going to be linked again to something that has to do with eight, maybe that hidden octad. If you guess that, you're absolutely right, although it may not be in exactly the way that you expect. Remember, by the way, that each of these perfect forms are, in effect, in a sphere, the most perfect form. Just wanted to remind you of that. All right, let's look at theorem eight. D says, moreover, the Kabbalistic expansion of the quaternary, according to the customary phrasing of numbers, when we say one, two, three, four, produces in sum the denary. The denary is associated with the Pythagorean tetractus discussed in earlier theorems, and I will say more about it today. When he says Kabbalah, he's going in denary, he's talking about the ten sephiroth. I'm not going to talk about that in this video. As I've mentioned before, I'm not going to talk about the 10 Sephiroth until we get through theorem 10, because the 10th Sephiroth is Malkuth. It's where, by this line of thought, you are. And there is the idea that from the manifest world, you're not going to be able to understand that until you get to 10, the place that you are, where you're perceiving the world. All right. So 
As Pythagoras himself used to say, one, two, three, and four make 10. It would be easy to just say, oh yeah, duh, one plus two plus three plus four is 10. Yeah, we know that. But remember, he's referring here to the Tetractus. So one, two, three, four is 10, same up this way, same down that way. There's 10 dots here. And it is regarded by Pythagoreans as the perfect form. One of these famous philosophers um, claimed that this form was so sacred, so admirable, so divine that followers of Pythagoras swore their oaths upon it. Remember also that the top of this, a monad, is basically a higher order decad. So if we have monad, a vesica piscis, the ternary, the quaternary, that's the type of way D is playing with numbers here. Let's continue then. It is not by chance that the rectilinear cross here, and we've seen this as a symbol of the ternary and quaternary in earlier theorems. So he's saying this is the 21st letter of the Roman alphabet. What, if you, if you count letters in our English alphabet, the 21st letter would be U, but, He's not writing this in English. This is the translation that Dr. Turner and I did that came out in 2021 from Orboros Press of Latin. In the Latin of D's time, the 21st letter is X. So now that probably makes more sense. So um, you have the rectilinear cross, you tilt it 45 degrees and you get an X. That's what he's talking about here. So it's made out of four straight lines. Is he going to suggest that even the letters we make with compass and straight edge? Well, of course, he absolutely is. You would expect no less in this time from someone who is so into sacred geometry. In fact, we will see some examples in later slides of Albert Durer, known today as a famous artist, but a couple generations before D, he was thought of just as, you know, he's a great artist, but he used principles like sacred proportions in his work. So he had his own geometry and in his geometry, he talked about the proportions you should literally use in writing letters. All right, let's keep going here. The 21st letter of the Roman alphabet. It might be a good idea to just compare alphabets in his three sacred languages here. So let's do that. Here's his Roman alphabet. Count to 21, you'll get X. He will say that that is going to be where the ternary three is strengthened by the septenary. So you get something like what? 21 area. Anyway, he is going to see incredible significance to that. And by the way, you really have not a ternary there, but a hidden quaternary because the X is the rectilinear cross, cross at least, is to D a symbol of the quaternary as well. Now, we might very well say in the 21st century, hey, that's just a coincidence, you know? Come on, guy. There is no coincidence with numbers it, to John D. If you don't know that by now, let me stress it again. There's no such thing as a numeric coincidence to John D. You're going to feel sometimes, maybe already do, like you're in a numeric echo chamber. So let's look at this again with that in mind. So three times seven is a 21. That's a wow. And then classical Latin has 21 native and two foreign letters. That's in Cicero's time. So it's 21. But now, by D's time, it has 22. Wow. Why? 22 letters in Hebrew create the world. Plus two of them that are foreign. Wow, that's 24. Why is that significant? Time measures, 24 hours in a day. That's no doubt why there's 24 theorems in this work. Um, when people in Old English, and I'm talking about English of the time of Beowulf, which is in effect a foreign language to modern English speakers, um, they used also a 24 letter Latin alphabet because like Old English was also a foreign language to many people writing Latin at the same time. Our alphabet today has, I'm sure you know, has 26 letters, but that's in modern English and modern English and our alphabet numerically is irrelevant to this discussion. I've already mentioned many times that the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. Those of you who have studied Hermetic Kabbalah know that's intensely significant. 
that the whole cosmos in the Sefer Yetzirah is created by the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. What about his other sacred language, Greek? The Euclidean Greek alphabet is what we still use today. It was also the one used in Dee's time, and it has 24 letters. Wow, 24. X, or chi, is the 22nd letter. Wow. So you start to see the hand of the divine in these things if you are thinking of this in terms of the context that John Dee is using. And he emphasizes this in his Latin simply by writing this in passive voice. Now, this is something, a way you, this would be the same actually in modern English if you use passive voice. You're hiding who did it, but we know who did it is God or the divine or the wise craftsman, all of these being the same to D in his Neoplatonic view of the world. So here is a representation of how you would draw the letter X with compass and straight edge. This is from Albert Durer in his work that we're going to talk about in a moment. But first, I just want to talk about how this hooks to a couple of our other contexts via a Neoplatonic view of creation. Um, there are, as you know, many Platonic dialogues where Plato has Socrates speak uh, to someone and develop an idea. One of the most famous is the Phaedrus. You may have looked at it in, in college in an intro to philosophy class, for example. Part of that is Socrates talking about Thoth, the Egyptian creator of writing. Sometimes it's transliterated as Thuth in different translations of the Phaedrus. And Thoth is associated with Mercury. Remember our discussion of the frontispiece and Mercury and all of the things that Mercury indicates to D. I'll put a link to that video below if you haven't seen it. The still bone, which can be equated with stylus. Now there is some irony that in the Phaedrus, Socrates objects to writing, though ironically we know anything about Socrates at all because Plato wrote it down. That's another whole discussion which you can have with your college intro to philosophy class. But it makes sense via this Neoplatonic view of the world that of course you're gonna consider letters as perfect forms because writing was invented by both Mercury. And Dee's whole glyph is a stylized mercury symbol, among many, many other things. So of course we can draw them with compass and straight edge. I do want to uh, point out that even as late as Dee's time and through all the Middle Ages and, and up through the end of the Renaissance, there's often confusion between the several different Euclids, the two most famous being Euclid of Alexandria. That's the sacred geometry guy that D writes the introduction to the first English translation of. The Euclid Greek alphabet is probably named after Euclid of Megara. And there's even more irony there because this Euclid was a student of Socrates and apparently was with, who was with Socrates when he died. All right. In the ancient Greek world, Theory was divine. Theory and theorem come from the same words as God. By the time you get to Roman times, Latin, and you, you have that theory taken and applied even more than the ancient Greeks did. And Rome was an empire, a brutal empire by some accounts. Maximilian, the king that he writes this to, becomes Holy Roman Emperor. And classical Latin inscriptions use Greek ideas of proportion and what's appropriate, but they often use them on monuments to show their power. So I wanna give you an example of that before um, we go much further. Let me show you up here, the Arch of Titus. Classical Latin inscriptions are written in square letters. That's both for a functional reason because of the type of tool you use and because of ideas of proportion. So you could, see how each of these, a square, could be drawn around them. Now, what do you flip a square into? Oh, we're going to get our hidden octad in a cube again. That's going to be important by the end of this video because we're going to go from all of this to conic sections. All right, 
blink your eye and it turns into a cube, blink again, the X in there will be a conic section. Hold that thought and let me say a couple things here about the Arch of Titus. I think it's worth saying while we talk about all this theory and deabsorbing Kabbalah, for example, that there is a very brutal history. So the Arch of Titus that I put up here as my example of Roman square capitals is today seen as a symbol of the Jewish diaspora, not only because it's one of the few monuments where you can see things that um, are artifacts of uh, the time of Herod, but also because it was put up to commemorate kicking the Jews out of Judea in, I think, 71 AD. So just thought I'd make this editorial comment. All is not well in the world of empire. We're looking at, at the theory that is merging things together. This is called syncretism, but it all often means if you have the benefit of the learning of everyone who you have oppressed, well, then you synthesize it into your ideas. Or yes, editorial comment, moving on. This is a English translation of Albert Durer's book on the just shaping of letters, sometimes about the just shaping of letters. But it's looking at letters, again, as shapes, as you can see from how even the title page is. It's online. I've got those links below here. By far, an easier way to follow this is a wonderful modern book by David Lance Goins. I think he started this in 67, worked on it through the 70s. If you look for it now on Amazon, it's about $1,800. But Goins did this just like I did the monad and I'm doing these videos, not for money. I mean, he has cost him more money and it's cost me more money to do this stuff and, and not made a dime from it. The idea is to share ideas that are so precious to us. And what Goins has done is put this whole book online at the internet archive and you can get it for free. You can go to Amazon and pay $1,800 if you want, or you can get it for free. Some of us think that learning ought to be free. All right. This is from one of Goins' poster sessions where he's showing how a compass and straight edge you would draw out these square capitals. And I've got that link below also. So now we're back to theoremate with all these things we've talked about in mind. And what are we going to get if we flip this X into 3D? Well, I've already told you, right? It's going to be a conic section. Keep in mind also this X is a chi, and sometimes it um, in, we use it to replace Christ, Xmas, for example. The X, why would that be? Is it blotting out Christ if you are a Christian? No, it's not. In fact, that whole concept just shows someone has no idea of history. If you put a chi row together, actually, that's often um, a symbol of Christianity because the next, if you write Christos in ancient Greek, you have a chi, then a row. So there is going to be a particular Christian significance to this, to, to John Dee, especially when he starts bringing back his biblical context. Now, if you remember... In Theorem 7, I talked about how this rectilinear cross gets superimposed up here. When we get to the Kabbalah, what you are going to have is this X in two different places, at least, actually more than two, but two major different places. One is as the cross of the elements and in the world that you stand in. The other will be at Tifereth, associated with six, six faces in a cube. And that will be associated with the sacrificed God, which some people today make Osiris, but then clearly to D, that sacrificed God is Christ. Okay, do you see the X here in this conic section? This will be important all the way through, but particularly when we get to Theorem 17, we're going to see him messing around with these conic sections. Um, students of Dan Winter watching this, yes, everything Dan talks about with kissing cones, you can do with this. D is also very interested in optics. Um, early versions of the camera may have been discovered by, uh, by D. At least there are some theorists who think so. And 
just for fun, let me talk about some other things you can do with this that I am not implying that Dee knew anything about. You get an idea similar to what we use today when we talk about how a point of light or a flash coming out of a point, the path it would take through space time. You know, you get diagrams like this. So cones and cones have, oops, sorry about that. Let me stop my share here. Um, are going to be the direction that D is going. And it is via his ideas of conception sections that he will stumble into ideas of higher dimensions. That's all I have for you today, folks. Sorry for the redo video, but I will see you next time. And let me stop the recording here and you